My name is Jerry Taylor, and I'm one of the solutions consultants here at Binary Stream. I'm really excited to be showing you our subscription billing suite of products. Here we have my Business Central screen now. Here I've got subscription billing installed and built right into Business Central. And because of that, you're going to find that our products are going to look and feel and act much the same as any other Business Central module. So starting here, we've got our advanced recurring contract billing module, that's ARC B. And then this menu is our advanced revenue and expense deferral module, it's called ARED. And then our third module, MIRA, the ASC 606 and IFRS 15 component is going to be bedded here into the contract billing module. It can also be purchased as a standalone, like I mentioned, but we find most of the time that our customers are often combining it with contract billing. So we're going to start with an actual contract and we have about a half an hour for the demo today. So I'm not going to be able to go into all the details I would during a normal demo. And that's where I'm answering some very specific questions. But I am going to give you a, a really good high level overview so you can see the capabilities of our product and hopefully, of course, how that can help you. So coming in here and I'm going to go into the billing schedule and that just billing schedule is is your sales contract or your sales agreement with your customer. So this list displayed here is all my active contracts. And before we open any one of these records, I'm just going to take a moment and uh, point out that while we're going to review everything today using a click by click, step by step method, you don't have to do this manually. You can also import your contracts from an outside system, whether it's CRM or otherwise. And coming up to the actions here, there's an import export option. As you can see, I can import XML files. I can also import CSV files. And all of this that you see here, we've also built these same capabilities into an APIs that are available for your use. So you're gonna have a lot of flexibility for streamlining and automating your processes, not only when you first start using the product, but also for your day-to-day -day business activities going forward. So now we're gonna take a look at a contract that represents Huli Computing's requirements. First thing to notice is this window looks much like a, any other business central window. Um, we do that on purpose to make this learning curve really quick. And we're going to start up here on the header. So the first field is this group. This is a billing schedule group. And it's essentially a way of defaulting certain fields of information onto the header. So if you were importing your contracts, it just saves you on some of the mapping requirements. Or if you're entering them manually, it just saves you on some keystrokes. So you might have certain contract types that you want to group together and so you can create different schedule groups. Maybe you've got some that are monthly, some that are annually, because this field also has the added benefit of being a filter field. So you can use that when you're doing your invoice generation process or for reporting as well. The next field is the contract number. And right now I've got these set as sequential, but you don't have to do that. You can bring this number in from your CRM using those unique numbers if you're importing, and you can also override it if you need to when you're manually entering. I've got a description for the contract. It's always an open field, so you could change this description if you needed to. And then next we have our customer. Customers are standard Business Central customers where we haven't created a separate list for you to manage. There's no dual subledger, and that way everything is integrated with Business Central right from the point of this contract through to invoicing, your receivables aging, your reporting, and, and so on and so forth. The next one is the end user. This is pretty cool. I'll, I'll just give you a quick example where here at Binary Stream, we sell our products to a partner. Then the partner sells to their customer, the end user. They're the ones who are actually using the software. So without this field, if a customer called in for questions or support to us, we wouldn't have any way of knowing who they are. So we added this field. And now when the person using the product calls in, we know exactly who they are. We can make sure that they get the support that they need. And these end users are also standard Business Central customers. We've added a flag on the customer card to indicate this where a customer can either be an end user 
and that same customer can be a contract holder with an end user. So coming over here now, we've got a line to month and that's pretty straightforward. It just means you can have all your contracts start at the beginning of the month. And if you do that, you can also choose to prorate for partial periods where you can either bill the prorated amount up front or you can leave it to the end of the contract, totally your choice. Coming back here, of course, we can have any start date and then we get into frequencies and these are the basic frequencies that you would normally find. However, this is pretty interesting when we combine this with the interval field. Let's say, for example, you have a contract you want to bill every two months. And if so, you'll simply select the monthly frequency, put a two in the interval field. That then becomes a multiplier where you're now billing every two months. If we had a contract we wanted to bill every three years, we put annual, put a three in the interval field, and now it's going to bill every three years. So this field right here effectively gives you the ability to have an infinite number of billing periods. Uh, when you put the number of periods monthly and then the number of periods, the system's going to automatically calculate the end date. And this one might be pretty obvious, but if you were said had a 32 month uh, contract, you don't want to have to be calculating it out on your fingers. This just makes it really easy for you. The termination date, of course, we can terminate our contracts. And the auto renew function becomes, you know, really quite powerful because if you're tracking everything in a spreadsheet, you're gonna to have to be pouring through your, your different worksheets to see, did you renew everything? Did you get everybody? And then of course, updating the spreadsheets to say what you build and when you build it. Well, the auto renew process is gonna take all that extra work away. And on top of that, we have this really great upcoming contract renewal report. So you know exactly when to expect for your renewals and when they're going to occur. Lastly, here we have a milestone. Milestone is just lines on a billing schedule that have no end date. And what it's waiting for is perhaps a consultant to come along and say, yes, this has completed. I've done the training or I've installed the software. Whatever the case may be, you would come down to the line on the contract. I've already got my end dates here, but it would be blank and you'd enter the end date here and that's automatically gonna trigger the invoicing for that item. So now coming up to the top, we've got dimensions that I can add to the contract as a whole, and you can also add your dimensions to each line individually as well. And then we have some actions. Now, this is a lot of the options that we're not going to talk about all of them today, but these are things we can do with the contract as a whole. And we're going to look at Hooli Computing's requirements for metering and usage, but we'll see more of that when we move on down to the line of the contract. So here's what we have. We can have the ability to copy, and that basically uses our contract as a template. I can terminate a contract, or I can put it on hold, and I can also remove that termination if I've made a mistake, or maybe I've you know, had an issue with a customer and that's been resolved, and we're gonna carry on with the contract. The same goes for the hold. I can remove the hold whenever you deem that to be appropriate. The escalation, we're going to take a moment and just walk through it because the escalation is maybe not quite what it sounds like. It's an agreement for a price adjustment at a designated point in time. That's either going to be an increase adjustment or a decrease based on this discount button here. You'll select a start date for it to take effect. It can be based on a percentage. It can be based on a dollar amount or a CPI schedule. And a CPI schedule is just your own rate schedule where you're going to input uh, dates and rates. And you can set up as many different rate schedules as you want to apply to all of your different contracts if you need. You could put an end date in here or you could leave it blank. And then when you come back up to the top and click process, now the system is going to calculate this and apply this escalation and roll it down to every single line on, item on the contract based on the terms that you've put in here. So now I'll just back out of here, and go back to the actions. Uh, we've got a renewal. So you can renew the, con renew the contract as a whole if you like. Um, archiving, just once the contract is complete, it'll take it out of your list of active contracts. And then the stubbing function is another one that takes a little bit more of a definition. And 
I don't know that we've ever had a customer come to us who is just starting out. So they plan to do subscription billing, but they haven't done anything yet. And that really, that just doesn't happen. So normally they have any number of active contracts on the go and they need to be able to import all of the activity that's occurred so far, but obviously they don't want to be re-invoicing for something that's already been invoiced. So in this case, the system, and it's called stubbing, you'll tell it that you've already invoiced everything prior, and maybe it's up to your date you pick, maybe May 31st of this year. So all of that prior activity is going to be identified as billed, and then new billing will start as of, say, June 1st. So now you have all of the related and historical contract data in the system, and it can be reported on, but of course, nobody then is going to get double bill. Invoicing, I can create a single invoice from here, or I can even just come in and preview what the next invoice is gonna look like, the milestone we talked about already, uh, revenue allocation we're gonna take a look at later. That's the ASC 606 or IPRS 15 piece, and I'm gonna bring up a contract and just show you how that works. So that's pretty much everything we need to look at today on the header. Let's move down to the body and get a look at the really good stuff for the contract lines. And here we have a series of different items. I've got support, tiered price item, professional services, hardware, and so on. And these can be either inventory items or service items, whatever you like, as long as it's an item. And now let's take a look at what we can actually achieve for our billing scenarios. And we're gonna start here with the billing type. And I can have three different billing types that I could potentially use for the same item. Starting here with standard. Now, standard just means that you know what you're billing, you know when you're billing. So whether it's monthly or quarterly or annually, you know the rate, you know the quantity, or I could use that same item as a usage item. And that means I'm gonna input the quantities for my specific billing periods, either manually or by importing. And then if I say it's a milestone item, that just means I don't know the end date yet. I'll leave it blank as we mentioned. Now coming over here to the pricing method, this is gonna add additional layers of functionality and complexity and as follows. So the standard is the simplest one. It's gonna be the price that's already set up for the item in Business Central. And you might think, well, what if I wanna be able to override the price and my, my sales reps have the ability to make a deal? Well, in that case, you're going to use the flat price and then you're gonna enter that price either manually or during your import. And it's important to note that it's not gonna change the price that's already set up in Business Central. It's just gonna change the price for this item on this line. Tier is gonna use price levels based on a quantity. And for example, um, Huli computing scenario, they wanna have a quantity range of zero to 100 that has a rate of $10, from 100 to 200 is gonna have a rate of 750, and anything over 200 will have a rate of 675. Then flat tier, gonna use a fixed amount, no matter the quantity within the range. And I always think of this like my internet plan where I'm paying a fixed amount whether I use it or not. So these tiered pricing, you can add to any item in Business Central, but the tiered prices are not going to, that I've added to the item setup, they're not gonna be selected unless I use tier like I've done here on the contract. So I've said tier, it's gonna pull in those rates. Otherwise, it's gonna use the standard price for this specific item. And the system will do that automatically. So now you have a lot of, billing combinations available to you, making that really powerful. And there's a couple more features as we come over here to the right. I want you to notice the end date and the frequency. And remembering up here on the header, I said the end date is 2022, March 31st. We've got a frequency of monthly. And this is going to, by default, roll down to the lines. And that's fine. However, each line on a contract can have its own set of parameters if it needs to, where I've got an end date of 2025, frequency of annually, I've got monthly, I've got a one-time item here, and that's great. So that effectively makes each one of these lines on a contract, a contract within a contract, so to speak. So then remembering the actions I showed you up at the top, 
We've got those same actions available here at the line level. So at the top, we looked at affecting them as a contract as a whole. And then down here, I can affect it for each individual line on the contract. So let's talk about Huli computing and the usage and metering options that they require. So here I've got a tiered price item. This is a usage item that's going, as you can see here, it's going to handle all of my month to month activity that's unknown to me at the time. So at, at some point I can go ahead and enter or import, import that information at any time that I want. So let's take a look at the details here and how that's done. And I'll come into display billing details. The first thing to notice is I have a schedule line for the duration of my contract. This is a monthly frequency for two years all the way up to 2022. So I now have 24 lines here. If it was a one-time frequency, we had a line like that, I would have one line here only or my a, a five year frequency for annual with an end date, I would have five lines here. So think of this like your spreadsheet. And th that's now going to go away. Now all of this information is in your ERP, it's handled automatically. We've captured our usage here and it's either been imported or I can enter it manually, but you don't have to worry about handling it manually if you've got a lot of volume and a way to bring that in. Uh, we took a look at this pricing where Huli Computing has a requirement for a decrease on the unit price as their, as their usage increases. So what the system does is it takes those tiered rates and it goes back and based on the quantity recalculates the average unit price for that. Over here, we've got our invoices. This now has the ability to drill back on the business central invoice. So we've already invoiced for uh, April and May, and when I click on this, it's going to take me back to my posted business central invoice. So now I've got this link, I've got standard business central functionality integrated right with ArcB. So coming back here, we'll take a note, these little flags here called build, the system automatically identifies these lines as build so that you're never going to have to worry about any duplicate billing. So backing out of here now, on this contract as well, we also have the ability to tie into our deferral module. I'll just show you quickly what that means. So this line here for support is billed for the year. It has an annual frequency as I'm shown here. Typically now, if I collect it in advance, I need to defer it. I'm gonna put it on the balance sheet and go ahead and recognize it monthly. So before we take a look at that, I'm just going to go back into the billing detail lines so you can see the difference between the usage item I set up as monthly and this annual maintenance plan. So I've got this set up for five years and we can see the schedules built out. Coming over here, just notice this unit price. I've actually put an escalation on this one specific line and that means the price is going to automatically increase every single year when I run the invoicing automatically. So now I have the ability for forecast reporting, even though there's only one posted invoice shown here, we don't post to the future and we don't need to because all of this information is now stored in a table for you to report on. So now the deferral component. So when I come back out, that line is still highlighted. I'm going to come in and manage advanced deferral options. Now when I open this up, you're going to see that I've already gone ahead and done some setup and I've identified this item as a deferral item by this checkbox. I've also said for this item on this contract, this is going to use a straight line schedule. I've got a 12 month monthly recognition template. I could override the start date and put any start date that I want. Here I've got my deferral accounts predefined. I can use cost of goods sold and discount if I need. And then I'm also identifying the recognition account as well. Now, Here's the key point in this window, and this is how the link to our deferral module works. When I run my invoicing process and this line gets invoiced, invoice, it's the posting of the sales invoice that's going to trigger creation of a deferral schedule with this information. So that's the link. There's nothing for the user to do. There's no additional steps for them to take. It's just going to happen automatically when the sales invoice gets posted. 
So now we've set up the contract. We've talked about some deferrals a little bit. We've talked about metering and we're going to look at some reporting. But first, let's talk about the process to streamline invoicing to our customers. So coming in here, um, I'll just make mention that, you know, there's a lot of items on here and we're going through a step by step. I've talked about imports, but you also have the ability to do a lot of these process using a batch process as well. So now coming in here to the invoice creator, this is where we're going to generate our customer invoices based on whatever billing interval you want, weekly, semi-monthly, monthly, whatever the case may be, and it's based here on this as of date. So the system is going to use this date to look at every single schedule we have, every item on every schedule that hasn't been invoiced and should be invoiced based on this as of date. So I could come in here, it's got today's date, but uh, if I wanted, I could go back and check a time and make sure that everything had been invoiced. And this is my demo environment, so I'm not always up to date on my invoicing, but let's say I go to the end of my last fiscal, fiscal, my last fiscal year, and when I type that in, I've got nothing here, so that's great news. It means everything has been invoiced appropriately. You know, you could do this on your month end processes and just check your previous month. And now I'm just going to put in uh, this year, June 1st. Here's all the lines that are now could be available for invoicing. If you have multiple contracts for the same customer, there's a consolidate. So you could consolidate those contracts onto one invoice. And then by nature of that, if they those contracts had the same items, you could also consolidate by item if you wish. Coming over here to the invoice date, um, you have the ability to use whatever invoice date you want. So you can you know, invoice in arrears or in advance, whatever the case may be. So those two dates, the invoice date and the as of date do not need to be the same. For some additional fine tuning on your invoice process, there's also a lot of filter options. And so I can come in here and select filters. Remember I said I can do the invoicing by my ArcBeat billing schedule group or by customer if I want. And then once I select that, which I'm leaving it blank, but I also have the ability to come in here and further restrict based on these lines, or I can go ahead and select everything. Once that's done, I can start the invoice process and I have a few options available to me here. I can either create the invoice and then go in and review them if I want, or I can just create and post the invoice. Or with this step, I can create, post, and email the invoices to my customers all by clicking this one button. So that's it. Once I've done that, I'm done. It's very, very simple, very easy to handle your invoicing process, no matter how much volume that you have. So now we're going to switch gears for just a moment and take a look at some reporting. And on the ARCB side, we have a lot of reports already built in. We've got the total schedule value and summary and detail, termination reports, MRR report, and that upcoming contract renewal report that I talked about. But we also have a, a suite of BI, Power BI reports that are really quite cool, and I've got them built right into my dashboard here. So we're going to take a look at these particular reports. I'll come in and expand this out. And here you can see what we've got down here on the bottom with these tabs. All of these Power BI reports are already built into Business Central as a SQL report, but it's just kind of fun, I think, to see them here in this Power BI format. So first we have the MRR report. You can filter this by contract and by customer. And when I click on any one of these nodes, I'm going to get a drill down to the transaction by transaction, item by item, full detail for every contract. And down here, we've got different data sets, but based on these different colored uh, boxes here, where it's new sale or upgrades or downgrades or churn. And then down at the bottom is the same information, but just displayed in a different table format view for you. The next one is the billing schedule details. This is just pretty simple contract total. So of course, there's still a lot of different filters you could put into place. And you can also do your MRR type description as a filter as well, but just a pretty simple overall contract value report here. 
And then we get into some of our A-RED reports where you can see declining balance, revenue waterfall, unrecognized revenue, cost of goods sold, recognized revenue report. These are really cool as well. Um, if I look at the declining balance, I've got it restricted to one customer and one schedule number right now. But, you know, if it gets it right down to the schedule, the item and the individual sales invoice that generated that deferral schedule. So we've built these out as a starting point. But of course, you can use any of the reporting tools that are available to be used with Business Central, and they're going to work with our product as well. So you're really very well covered for any of your own unique report, uh, reporting requirements that you might have. So now going back to the deferrable items, and I showed you the deferrable item on the contract. So let's take a look at what happens when the sales invoice is posted. Before I go into the deferral schedule, um, just remember that the deferral schedule gets created without any user intervention. And coming in here, we're going to focus on our revenue deferrals, but just know that whether it's if you're doing expense deferrals from your purchasing side or general journal entries for your prepaids, it's going to work exactly the same way as what I'm showing you for the revenue deferral. Now, I've got a schedule already set up, which was from that contract we just looked at. So let's come in here. Now, the first thing to notice is this is all from the, what we saw set up on the contract where we've said it's a straight line schedule. It's a 12 month monthly. Here's the specific sales invoice that triggered the generation of this deferral schedule. I've got the item shown here and the customer. So pretty much everything you might possibly want to see to, as far as where this deferral schedule came from. Over here, I've got my amounts down here, or sorry, the accounts over here. And then down here in the body, these are all the lines, the amounts that have been calculated across the 12 months. It's going to be the basis for my declining balance reports and so on. However, my GL reflects the current period only. So here you can see these are the recognition entries. I could drill back to the Business Central journal entries if I wanted to see those. And now all of this is automatically created. So all of your data is right here. If you had any adjustments, they would show up. It's all available for analysis and reporting. And instead of keeping it in the spreadsheet, we're now storing this information in that SQL table so you can post those details at the time that you need to. Up here on the header, we've got some actions. And there's a few actions here, but we're going to focus mostly on the modify feature. And we can do this because we're not posting to the future. So I can easily make adjustments to the schedule whenever I need to. And if we say, for example, I set this one up and I set it up for a 12 month monthly template, but I might realize at any point in time, oh my gosh, this was actually meant to be a 24 month uh, schedule. So that's not a problem. That's fine. I can come in here, select my new schedule. And it's going to automatically calculate out all of the amounts starting from here. Because as you saw on the previous screen, I already recognized two months so it's showing it as recognized. So it's going to recalculate the amounts to be recognized from that point going forward. I could, if I wanted to come back and if I come up here, I can reverse those original entries and redo my recognition entries. But I don't like to go back and adjust my prior periods. So for me, the true up is just fine and it'll go ahead and make the changes from here. So this isn't a problem now because I've not changed anything on the balance sheet. My total is still exactly the same. I'm just saying that from this point going forward, these are the amounts that are going to be used. So really easy to make those adjustments. You're not locked into anything. And uh, I also have the, whoops, I'll just come back out of here. We also have the ability to reclass your deferral account. So say, for example, it's, uh, that maybe, it, maybe it's, maybe it's a uh, year, oh, I'll just pop back in here. There we go. Okay, there we go. Maybe it's, you know, the end of the year, your CFO comes along and says, hey, we're, we're, we're switching, we're changing things up. 
and we're going to be using new deferral accounts going forward. So now you have the ability to take these default accounts and put in new deferral accounts. So what's gonna happen is once you update it, a journal entry is going to be processed. It's gonna take them out of one, the balances out of the one account, put them into the other account. You have full audit trail, full reporting functionality, everything is tracked for you and you're simply moving it from one GL, reclassifying to another GL, and then your process is gonna carry on as before. That's it, very, very simple to handle. So now we've looked at our deferral schedule and now we need to take a look at the actual recognition process. And this is going to look much like what you saw in the invoicing process. Again, it's gonna be based on a cutoff date. So when this comes up, here you can see all my different lines here. If I come into manage, I'm gonna edit the list and I'm gonna be able to change my cutoff date change my transaction date. Of course, I have those same filtering options that I can go through. I can also further restrict the lines if I need to. But once I'm finished and I'm happy with that, I say, yes, this is actually what I wanna recognize. I'll come up here and click the recognize button. And now when I click process, these amounts are gonna create a journal entry that takes it out of the balance sheet puts it on the P&L. Again, very, very simple and very easy. So there's no more manual processes. And I would suggest based on what our customers tell us, saving you a considerable amount of time during your month end close process. So we looked at our reports and I'll just back out of here. Um, we've also got a couple of really friendly, uh, audit friendly reports that we've got here with a deferral balance summary report. And we've also got a deferral balance details report. So it's great that you can see the balance that's in the account, but your auditor might come along and say, well, that's fine, but I'm going through this process. I wanna see what actually makes up the balance as of last October. Whatever the date may be, you'll go ahead and put the date in here. You can get an historical as of set of information. And when I click preview, when this pops up, I'm gonna get a line by line, let me just make that a bit bigger for you. I now have a line by line detail of all the transactions that made up that balance at that particular point in time. So really great report there. And now we're getting close to the end and we have a few minutes left. I wanna be able to touch on the mirror. It's very, very easy to show. And how that works is you're gonna populate a table with all of your items that could come under the ASC 606 and IPRS 15 rules. And it's really easier to understand if I show you. So I'm gonna come into a setup screen here. And it's a Mira item standalone selling price. So I'm gonna come in here and set up prices for all those items that I might be using that way, like I mentioned. And you're gonna put in a standalone selling price. It's either gonna be a flat amount or you can base it on a sales price, an invoice price, a uh, percent, of, if it's a kit, you can make it a percent of the parent invoice price. And I'll just click down here so you can see the options that are available, if it would let me. Quite, it's not, I don't know why that's giving me trouble, but it's quite a few options that you can make the basis for your standalone selling price. And once you've done that, that's gonna be the end of the user intervention, and that's the end of the manual steps. And now we'll go in and take a look at uh, a mirror contract example that I've already got set up and see what happens in this case. So here's my mirror contract. These are all of my items that I've got set up on this contract. You just would have seen those on that standalone selling price table. Now we'll come up here to our revenue allocation that I showed earlier, and we'll take a look at what's gonna happen when we invoice. So here's the items that we have on the contract. This is the price that I have on the contract. This is including a, a discount. Coming over here, you can see this is the actual standalone selling price from my table. And then this column here, this is what's gonna go on the P&L. These are the amounts after the reallocations, after removing any free items and removing discounts, the dollar amount is still gonna add up totally, nothing goes missing, but now when the auditors come in, they're gonna be very, very happy because this is now gap compliant 
It now harmonizes your revenue in line with ASC 606 and IFRS 15 compliance. So that's everything I wanted to show you today. I know it's a lot of information in a really short period of time, and hopefully that's given you uh, enough to pique your interest or perhaps bring up any additional questions. So I really want to thank everybody for joining us today. Um, if you'd like to receive more information, please reach out to your partner or your sales contact at Binary Stream. We would be very happy to arrange a discovery call and then a personalized demo for your company. You can certainly send us an email at sales at binarystream.com. We'd be very happy to make a referral for you and, of course, get the ball rolling.